Well, uh, no, so on this, again, welcome. My name is Simeon Han, um, and uh, just on this introduction slide, what I'm going to do today is introduce people. Um, my goal is to introduce you to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. That's a pretty broad organization. Uh, and then talking with Caroline um, in scoping this, uh, we talked about a couple topics, but uh, living shorelines, um, We'll, we'll spend a little bit of time on that. And as Linda mentioned, I work in a lot of urban areas. So we'll talk about urban restoration. Now on the on the bottom right photo uh, is myself in January. So on the far left is Dr. Uh, Jacobs. He's the administrator of NOAA. And on the far right um, is my Office of Response and Restoration Director. Next to him is the acting uh, National Ocean Service director and the deputy is uh, to my left. So with that, I got this award for um, diversity and inclusion, which was really um, kind of special to me because I was nominated by a colleague and, and some people in the community that I work with. So it was uh, much appreciated. So next slide, uh, Linda. And, and uh, I think you put the video on the next slide, right? Yep. I wanted to say uh, just before she starts the video here that, that Noah had a birthday of sorts this year, uh, 50 years, it says there from 1970 to 2020. And um, this is just a little short uh, video um, about Noah and, 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 that, and celebrating that birthday, so. Can you see the screen? Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. When our young nation resolved to survey our ocean and coasts, we set a course. As our population grew and commerce needed accurate weather predictions, we rose to the challenge. When our seafood supply faced an uncertain future and protecting marine life became essential, we answered the call. As our successes grew, so did we. And after centuries of learning, the sharpest minds in the earth sciences came together to form the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Our relationship with the planet is now more dynamic than ever. Shifting environmental systems and our understanding of them continue to shape the way we live, work, and explore. Today, we are stewards for a cleaner, healthier, and more sustainable ocean. Our innovation powers the blue economy. Life and property with every forecast and warning, driven by one of the largest streams of observation data on Earth. We are global leaders in environmental sciences and technologies. We soar higher, dive deeper, and venture farther to understand our changing planet. We are NOAA. Okay, Linda, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if everybody got to see that. It didn't play for me. It did uh, before, but uh, if not, uh, you can um, go back to this link. It's on the YouTube, um, and there's some other ones. So uh, next, next slide, Linda. Okay, please. the link is at the bottom of this slide, if you can see it. So, okay. Okay, so in NOAA, the, the mission is kind of highlighted in that video, and, and NOAA is one of, even though it's a 50-year uh, uh, anniversary, um, NOAA services go back um, to one of the earliest federal uh, agencies, if you will. So like in 1807, Thomas Jefferson uh, commissioned the survey of the coast. And then um, and like in the mid 1800s, Ulysses S. Grant established the Weather Warning Office. Um, and then there was, you know, other offices, agencies involved with seafood and everything. So we were actually, NOAA was actually um, designated in 1970. And um, so climate, weather, ocean and coast, uh, a lot of education, mostly a science office, conserving, um, marine ecosystems and coastal ecosystems and, and resources. And our vision of the future is really uh, focused on, on resiliency, a term many of people have heard, but that can, relates to resilient uh, 
uh, a resilient environment, ecosystems, uh, also the communities and the economies. That's a theme that I'll carry through the presentation. And all these things have to be resilient in the face of change. And there's also, as I think we're all seeing and experiencing changes occurring in economies, ecosystems, and even socially in the communities. Uh, next slide, Linda. So uh, this is another site um, on the left. Uh, it shows a map of where NOAA is located throughout the country. And if you go nowhere in your state, uh, you can find her if you're traveling. I, 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 well, sometimes when I'm traveling, I go and visit uh, some of these NOAA offices. Uh, and so we have different uh, labs and fishery science centers. Uh, obviously, most have uh, 122 other forecast offices. I'm just highlighting some of these things. We have National Estuarine Research Reserves. There are some in Virginia. Every state has some. So they're like <clears throat> kind of like a national park, if you will, um, usually smaller, um, but uh, we're um, estuarine research is. Es an estuary is where the river uh, meets the ocean, if you will. And um, we have some marine monuments. And um, we, you know, we, we have a lot of assets, too. Um, you'll see in the slides uh, a bunch of radars and, and things for the weather service. We have ships and aircrafts and uh, satellites. A lot of supercomputing um, capabilities and needs buildings for for uh, I'll show you some of the uh, you know large data sets and the computing that's needed to manage a lot of this data. Next slide, Linda. <laughs> uh, if we could get, go back one slide for quickly, Linda. I'm sorry. Well, and one more back there, one more from there. I'm sorry. I, I, I wanted to mention the line offices in NOAA on the right. Basically, we have the National Ocean Service, where, where, which I work in, and I'll talk more about that. We have um, the National Marine Fisheries Service that uh, manages fisheries, as the name implies. They also manage endangered species, uh, such as sea turtles and whales and um, other marine mammals. And we work closely with with them in, in our damage assessment program, I'll mention. Um, the Weather Service, pretty, um, you know, the name uh, describes itself well. That's the weather prediction. Uh, it pr provides, you know, for stations, uh, you know, to, to do their own forecasts. Uh, but we know what provides most of the weather. And then we have our National uh, Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service, which is called NASDIS. So those are our, our main offices. Lane line offices in our office of uh, research, atmospheric research as well. So you can skip a, a forward a couple, Linda, to the National Ocean Service. Yeah, so this is where where I work, and um, the mission was pretty straightforward. Uh, partnerships is the big word. <laughs> Again, all evolving economic, environmental, and social pressures on our oceans and coasts. So it's not just the oceans, it's it's the coast. And and when we talk about the coasts, it's that's not just like the bays and stuff. So we have a lot of tidal rivers and uh, you know, their coast the coastal zones are, are designated so it, it they go quite pretty far inland in some in some instances. Like Del the state of Delaware almost is entirely in the coastal zone. Um and there's our, our NOAA program offices within National Ocean Service. And I'll just highlight a couple of uh, those real quick. Um, next slide, Linda. Um, these are some of the congressional mandates that we have in our in the Ocean Service. Um, not sure what happened to this slide. It, it kind of shifted a little bit. But the Coastal Zone Management Act, um, the Coral Reef Conservation Act, harmful algal blooms, uh, marine debris is a relatively new one, so that's cleaning up a lot of fish and abandoned fishing gear and other type of you know trash in the in the ocean. Um, I work in particular with Superfund and the Oil Pollution Act, which isn't showing 
on this slide. Um, it's, it's probably about, it's it, it's beneath there. It, it, it should have been side by side, but I don't, I'm not exactly sure what happened to it. So next slide, Linda. So the Center for Operational Oceanographic Products and Services, what we call co-ops, they um, really uh, look at water level observations um, in tidal, you know, tidal areas, water levels, basically uh, predict the tide and the currents and uh, are crucial for uh, marine navigation. Next slide. We have uh, our integrated ocean observing system, which is called IUS. And uh, so this is uh, a recent um, office and comes in with a lot of national ocean planning that occurring but there's a lot of data collected from ships from buoys from uh, radar um, and this could be water quality it could be um, marine species that are you know that are tagged and are and are followed by uh, telemetry um, um, you know water temperature currents all these kind of things are, are put together and then are used in modeling to help answer a lot of different questions but there was always a lot of people collecting a lot of data and this integrated ocean service ocean observing system pulls it together uh, next slide Lynn. our national center for coastal ocean science or NCOSC um, does a lot of environmental research uh, in the environment ecotoxicology habitat mapping ecological assessments one thing the harmful al algal bloom um, it's a pretty big issue the last few years um, in Florida but uh, you know that happens every year in the Chesapeake Bay and it causes uh, dead zones um, same in the Gulf of Mexico and other areas so um, that's our uh, National Coastal or NCOS, they also have a muscle watch program. So they look at like contaminants on a large scale to see, you know, what kind of contaminants are getting into our, our seafood. Next slide. Our geodetic survey is used for spatial referencing um, in uh, coastal mapping, in particular, um, like shoreline. Uh, mapping. So shorelines are always changing. The aeronautical survey program has the LIDAR. Uh, people might be familiar with that, but the GPS product that, that we all use, um, that is our National Geodetic Survey. Next slide. Our Office of Coastal Management works closely with the state. So each state has, each coastal state has a coastal um, zone program and uh, Virginia has one as well. So we provide uh, direct funding to the states and they kind of operate, you know, based on the state's needs with, uh, with our oversight. Um, in this, we also have um, our National Estuarine Research Reserve System and um, produces uh, a, a lot of products. This Digital Coast um, is a product that's used by a lot of communities, coastal communities. Um, to help right now, like with uh, sea level rise and and resilience planning. Next, next slide. <clears throat> the the Coast Survey, as I mentioned, goes all the way back to 1807. They produced a nautical chart, so a lot of boaters might be familiar with the Coast Survey uh, and and the nautical chart, so they know the water depths as they're moving around. Um, most of these charts now are all digitally available and, and online. And, um, next slide. Uh, we have our Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, uh, and there are um, sanctuaries in Virginia as well for, um, I think, the Monitor and the Merrimack is uh, one, the most famous one. And so it also looks at heritage resource protection um, but we we have them in different areas to protect coral and 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 other other areas. So national marine sanctuaries are like uh, national wildlife preserves, perhaps underwater. Next slide. 
And then my office is, is the Office of Response and Restoration. So we respond to oil and chemical spills um, and also waste sites, that, you know, the hazardous waste sites. Um, that's under the Superfund Act. We do a lot with uh, our hurricanes uh, now. And, with, you know, there's a lot of marine debris, uh, a lot of boats that have to be recovered and all kinds of um, stuff after storms. Um, and we work, you know, together with, the uh, Coast Guard uh, a lot for the response. Um, let's go to the next slide. So in our Office of Response and Restoration, our, our mission, uh, the, where I particularly work in is in natural resource damage assessments, which uh, Linda mentioned. So after there's a spill or uh, a cleanup, we do things, uh, you know, to look at the damage that was caused. So, like, the, the photos are for the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, and um, I was assigned to be the technical work group leader for marine mammals and sea turtles when that started. So, those are some photos which we obtained from our NOAA aircraft and such uh, on the left of, of dolphins uh, breaching through oil. Um, on the right, we see sea turtles. So these these receptors, these species were 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 um, harmed um, by this spill. And in our damage assessment, uh, we reached an agreement. I forgot maybe the exact amount, but it was billions of dollars to do restoration in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, certain um, dolphin pods within their pods is close enough word to call them uh, were, were more impacted in Louisiana. So, you know, uh, do, doing restoration for dolphins uh, required some some thinking. You know, we, don't, we restore mostly their habitats, but uh, with sea turtles, we do a lot of things to protect them while they're nesting. Um, and also out in the water, they get uh, caught as bycatch in fisheries a lot. So we did a lot to try to restore turtles. We work together with the Fish and Wildlife Service on these damage assessments and also with the states. And then Waynesboro, not too far from you guys, there was a, a very large natural resource damage assessment in my hometown of Waynesboro on the South River for like $50 million for mercury <laughs> spilled into the South River. No, we did not work on that. Uh, it's too far inland. Our, our um, trust resources, as they're called, aren't there. So the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, worked with the Virginia DEQ on that, and there's a, a lot of restoration. So some people may be familiar with that. Next slide, Linda. So we do a lot of planning and preparedness before the storm, before the spill, you know, working with the Coast Guards and others. So, you know, emergency response has to be efficient, has to be quick. And um, we go all the way through, as I mentioned, to the damage assessment and the restoration. Uh, type of restoration projects often done could be wetland restoration, could be dam removals, um, mussel bed, oyster beds, um, a, a large variety of uh, marine coastal restoration projects. Next slide. Um, on this slide, it's just showing where we have oil and hazardous uh, uh, waste site cases. And the green ones are for ship groundings, especially in our sanctuaries. Um, if a ship grounds and, and uh, scars uh, coral or, or something, they have to replace and restore the coral that was impacted as well. So. Um, on the top, it shows kind of where we work all around the country, and then I zoomed in some to show the sites that I work, um, and this is on the bottom left, um, in kind of that I-95 corridor. And on the right, in our region, I did a lot of work with uh, military bases and, and on the Chesapeake Bay. And um, you can see... Um, Working with them is a little bit different because, you know, the government can't sue the government to actually, um, you know, for natural resource damage assessments, they are um, like legal settlements. So in here we work cooperatively with them and have done a lot of restoration um, and cleanup. The military bases have their unique uh, contaminants, so they, um, they actually lead their own investigation. I used to work for the military as well for 10 years before, as I mentioned earlier, I've been with NOAA for 20 years. Um, next slide, 
Uh, Linda, I'll show you an example. This is from the Indian Head Mattawoman Creek site on the left. You know, on uh, is an, an area where there was a lot of ordnance, and so typically, you know, we we can't dig that up and remove it. Uh, it's there's a lot of danger, and we, we don't really know where the ordnance is all the time. Uh, you know, the disposal practices were much different back at this time, but it's. And this is kind of leading into a topic. If you can see on the left there, the objective initially was to install a um, a hardened shoreline, a um, a retaining wall, and we worked with them to construct a um, a living shoreline, which you see on the right. Um, and we'll talk a little bit uh, more about living shorelines here in a little bit in a second. Next um, slide, Linda. So yeah, we're shifting to living shorelines. And then we'll shift into urban restoration. Um, on the top left is it was an interesting photo uh, from the International Space Station. And uh, I, I saw it on Facebook and uh, it was interesting to me because they identified the Chesapeake Bay, which you can see is that large body of water to the left um, of the two. And then they also acknowledged Delaware, Pennsylvania, and Jersey too, but they didn't acknowledge the Delaware Bay. So we, all, in in our area, we often uh, think that we don't get as much attention as the Chesapeake and and the Delaware, and there's a lot of reasons, uh, perhaps, for that. Um, but when you bottom left is our Delaware estuary watershed, uh, and it just shows it, it's. It's different from the uh, Chesapeake, perhaps. So the Delaware Bay moves into the Delaware River. The Delaware River is tidal all the way up to Trenton, New Jersey. So that shows like kind of the coastal um, influence or, or zone. And it's a six foot tide all the way up there. And, you know, it's, it's as you move like from the bay through Wilmington, Philadelphia area, you see on the bottom right, it's heavily developed, um, you know, this birthplace of the country in Philadelphia. And uh, and then as you move further up in the watershed, it, it turns into a national scenic river uh, again. So his, historically, a lot of the attention, even in the Delaware watershed, has been towards the upper watershed uh, where the um, national wild and scenic river designation is, and then the bay, and not in what we call the industrial area. Next Next slide. So what, 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 on that last slide, what we're going to talk about a little bit here, just introduces the concept of using green infrastructure for coastal resilience. That development is generally been bad on on the coast. Um, we haven't managed um, our water uh, and land in you know the most environmentally protective ways. So now there's more of appreciation of the services that. Um, that the green infrastructure provides. So even if it's a developed area, green infrastructure can be restored to some of these areas. So, you know, the, the concept of green infrastructure, using natural processes um, to absorb rainfall, lessen wave energy, reduce erosion, it also provides habitat and, and recreational opportunities. Applies from the landscape level all the way, you know, to a watershed, to a community, a site, even to a specific shoreline, and it, you know, crosses the rural to urban divide, and um, you know, goes from upland to coastal. So, you know, you can't really manage your rivers and your bays and your oceans without considering and, and managing your land as, as well. Next slide. So living shoreline, uh, a broad definition, it's kind of hard to read there, is the, it's made up of uh, native material, it, vegetation, and it's, it, it has other soft elements, um, sometimes in combination with a hard or shoreline structure like an oyster reef or, or some rock sills. We'll, we'll show some examples. Um, here is uh, a, a, at the bottom, of the picture is a living shoreline at our, our Beaufort Laboratory. Um, and 
and this is a guidance uh, document for using living shorelines uh, that NOAA published in 2015. Next slide. So you have a kind of a continuum of uh, from green to gray. Uh, you know, a, a, a natural, fairly natural shoreline may just have you know vegetation uh, on the far left. On the one that says edging may have some vegetation. May use something like a coconut log, um, some kind of rolled biodegradable log that uh, just protects a little bit. And then sills are are like uh, small rocks, so uh, you could use oysters, things like that. Moving over to uh, breakwaters, which are further out in the water, break the wave energy out in the water versus on the shore. A revetment um, is, uh, uh, you know, a large, large stones piled along the shoreline, and a bulkhead is a vertical wall. So that's, that's how it moves from green to gray. Next slide. On the on the right in that picture is the an old bulkhead in in uh, Philadelphia. But uh, so basically, the the living shoreline principles are to try to maintain and incorporate as much green as possible. Um, not just because it's prettier, but uh, it provides better services, better habitat, better water quality. Um, you know, it it needs to consider regional and site specific. Um, factors, uh, the wave energy could be different uh, depending on the fetch, you know, which way the wind's blowing. Ship traffic in the Delaware River with the container ships is a site-specific thing we have to plan for. Um, it's very science-driven, uh, uh, um, and we try to maximize as many, you know, ecosystem services, we, we, we call them, as possible. And that's generally like water quality, uh, habitat. Uh, recreational value. Next slide. Uh, th so this was after Hurricane Irene in North Carolina, um, and, it, and it highlights again why we're we supporting these living shorelines. Is you can see the bulkheads actually, and these are small bulkheads um, here, but they were actually destroyed. And, um, you know, the large bulkheads, what happens there is the wave hits them, the wave energy gets transferred to the side, and so you'll get re erosion at the side. And, you know, you can get into some pretty um, pretty big uh, coastal land disagreements between adjacent landowners. So if somebody comes in and puts in a bulkhead, it may erode the adjacent property, uh, for instance. And, um, but here, um, the living shorelines functioned there was no damage, and there was actually increased uh, vegetative growth shortly after the storm. And you can see where the bulkheads were completely destroyed. Next slide. These are some examples, the pictures I've taken of some shorelines in the urban Delaware River. Uh, bottom left is, uh, is now a state park, but that was a filled in um, wetland of the Delaware River. It's filled in with slag from the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad, uh, there was a big steel industry in the area. So this was kind of reclaimed. Uh, this shoreline is going to need a lot of work, uh, work in the future. It's about a mile long, and um, you can see the erosion. That's all slag and, and other debris that's the, that will erode out into the river if not protected. The one in the middle kind of shows that it was from a a concrete plant where the trucks at the end of the day to shore up their shoreline would just back up to the river and dump the concrete. Um, on the top right, you know, we have a lot of abandoned piers um, and bulkheads associated with those. They become big safety hazards and, you know, provide problems to people getting access to the river. And on the bottom right, again, it's kind of a shoreline not well maintained. Uh, people have put uh, rip wrap, you know, concrete debris, but you can see they've cut the vegetation mostly all the way. There's one tree that was saved and they mow right up to the um, shoreline. So that's a highly vulnerable shoreline. Next slide. We have a couple examples here. So this is Lardner's Point, um, Philadelphia. It's, you can see uh, that shoreline abandoned uh, bulkhead area uh, was turned into a park. Um, 
on the top right, just for location, you might be able to see that's the Tacony Palmyra Bridge. It's one of the bridges that goes from Pennsylvania to New Jersey. In the bottom center, um, th those are large tree roots. Uh, both, that's a whole tree that sometimes gets washed down into uh, the river. It just shows how the roast of the forces coming off a of developed watershed can be. We had large equipment out there, so we took the, the opportunity and use these root walls on well, root wads we call them on our shoreline. Sometimes they are strategically, you know, put um, and designed to go in there. So that's why we did that. Next slide. This is a project. Uh, this is Joe Rieger from the Elizabeth River Project. I'll talk a little bit uh, more about him. That's uh, a group out of uh, uh, Norfolk. Um, but if, if hardened shorelines um, are required or are already there, they, there are things that can be done to improve them. So this is a, a saltwater area, so oysters uh, can be used there. Um, the, the, uh, the, the salt marsh, uh, Spartina, uh, can be grown there. Um, but not too much seagrass uh, in this particular thing, but um, you know, maintaining the wetlands and the and vegetation uh, adjacent or above it, they, it's called a riparian buffer. There's now, and we'll I'll show with a couple other examples in the future, but you can actually add, you know, fish habitat on the face of a vertical bulkhead, um, but hanging baskets or other things like that. So there's a lot of things that can be done. Next slide. Uh, Money Point was a project the Elizabeth River Project did. It was an old uh, wood treating facility. Uh, and so they had a lot of creosote uh, into the ground, into the water, into the sediments. And, um, and this was um, designed and cleaned up and we built in the restoration. So you can see like uh, that's called a breakwater in the upper left and you can see the spacing in there to allow the water come in and out. That's a restored wetland. You can see the oyster uh, castles being placed on the shoreline. So it's a really highly successful um, community nonprofit, the Elizabeth River Project. I've worked for a long time. We partner a lot with them. And, and really, that's how most of the work's going to get done across the country right, at the local level. Uh, and, with, and so education and engagement is important. But we, you know, we provide some funding different times, but you know, I can't emphasize enough how much a good local community organization and how important they are. Next slide. Um, so sometimes we have some non-regulatory issues, uh, abandoned areas. We call these brownfields. So there's not what we call a responsible party like uh, Exxon or DuPont or anybody, they were, they're all gone. So these are industries sometimes from the 1850s in the Northeast. And, you know, they're associated a, a large part with uh, degraded um, infrastructure and communities, what we call environmental justice communities. And a lot of times they're urban um, inner city black communities. Um, and we do a lot of work with them. I, I um, uh, have a a strong basketball background. My daughter played basketball at Villanova, and so I, I have a lot of connection with these communities just growing up, and and uh, I still work and train there. Um, so these examples being like Wilmington, Philadelphia, Camden, even Baltimore and, and, and D.C. from the basketball side. So this is an important thing because remember I talked about like emerging social, adapting to social things, you know, providing equitable you know, access to, to water and nice environments and trails and stuff is an important thing. So we have our Urban Waters Federal Partnership, and we, we try to work uh, with other federal agencies and also states and local entities to address really some of these forgotten, abandoned areas that are, that were once, you know, are, are some of our most highly productive uh, waterways and ecosystems uh, in the country. That's why a lot of the founding was done there. Next slide. I think I have a few more. I, um, yeah, go on back past that one. That was something. This, uh, so this was uh, this project here, and there's a link on the bottom that we won't hook, but it um, 
um, if you and the link on the top actually will, will take you there. Uh, this was highlighted on CBS News uh, this morning, and there actually there were two projects, and I work on both of them. One is the Newtown Creek, which uh, separates Bronx and Queens, uh, and this particular project in Wilmington is called the South Wilmington Wetlands. And you can see this looks like, and this same thing in Norfolk on the bottom right, that looks like a major flood hurricane thing. That's like from a a, a regular rainstorm on, a, you know, at the wrong tide time of a tidal cycle, and so um, you know the 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 sewers, combined sewers, are what they're called. Uh, they back up and they flood the neighborhoods, and a lot of times, you still to this day in some of these communities, people would really get waste material, sewage. Um, so there's serious environmental justice issues. So and on the top there is a is a uh, this project called South Wilmington Wetland will provide flood storage, and so that this, these backups won't occur, it will reduce the flooding. It also provides a beautiful, you know, park. There's going to be a trail there that takes this community that uh, was relatively isolated. It's called Southbridge, and allow them to access other parts of the city, grocery stores, um, things like this. So this was. A really highly celebrated urban um, wetland restoration project. Next slide. This next project that we talked about is in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, Camden was in the news recently uh, regarding its police force. Um, Linda told me not to get political, so I'm not being political, but this is just um, you know factual. They just Banded the police department in like 2008, and you know they they have a police department, but it was rebuilt. Uh, the community is going through um, a rebuilding of sorts environmentally and and everything. And Camden used to have like Campbell Soup, RCA, Victrola. Uh, it's right across the river from Philadelphia. Um, major shipbuilding stuff, um, but uh, this particular area was. Uh, an 85 acre landfill area that along the river. I have pictures which I didn't show here that along the waterfront, there's uh, along the shoreline there, there's cars, there's barrels, and you know, all kinds of stuff. But it was abandoned for so long that it, it actually doesn't look like a landfill and it's uh, vegetated. Uh, and, you know, regulations would require to, you know, uh, cut those trees down, put some kind of liner, and then make it look like a landfill again. So I wor we work closely with New Jersey DEP and the community. And uh, next slide, I'll, I'll show what, what the um, what the plan is on the bottom right there. That's the conceptual plan. So, but at the same time, the Ray, the Croc Center, um, the Ray Croc Foundation from McDonald's Croc uh, invested. Um, a lot of money for the uh, Salvation Army. Um, and so that building was built as a community center. Uh, and it's supporting it now is uh, a, a nice park with walkways, uh, an ecologically restored area. Um, it's going to have access for kayaking. Um, we have all kinds of youth education groups. And, and, and so there's now inner city youth back on the water taking people on tours. A really celebrated thing. So Camden has, you know, as you can see on the left, potentially, you know, about three quarters of their land is kind of available for reclamation. It's called brownfields, just contaminated or dilapidated infrastructure and stuff. But it's it's in a in a major rebuilding that's just really um, enlisted, enlightening to see. Next next slide. I have a couple more slides here. This is the Anacostia River in D.C. This was called the Forgotten River. Um, so on the left, you can see there how that Anacostia River basically was dredged and straightened. And there's a seawall that, that was placed on both sides. So it almost became like a canal. On the left of the... Um, River there in that picture is a restored area. That was a former uh, solid waste landfill, which we excavated and consolidated in a small patch of the area, and then we restored uh, about 12 acres of wetlands there, tidal wetlands. Those are tidal wetlands, freshwater tidal wetlands, which are really rare wetlands. Uh, they're the rarest of 
the rare. Everybody's kind of heard how much wetlands we are losing, but freshwater tidal because of developments are really rare. So this increased the tidal wetland acreage, this one project in the Anacosta River by like 20%. And then in the freshwater tidal area, we do a, a, we use mussels instead of oysters in a similar way. Now mussels don't build reefs like oysters do. However, they are very efficient in, in uh, stabilizing the sediment and because uh, uh, they live in the sediment in a river and they also filter the water. Um, so these are, are look, being looked at by municipalities even to help them with their water treatment uh, issues. Next slide. Um, these are just a couple of examples here of some really innovative stuff, um, which you might see like in Baltimore Inner Harbor or in Philadelphia if you come to Penn's Landing. Uh, on the Anacosta River, lower Anacosta River, there's going to be uh, even things to uh, reintroduce swimming uh, back to the community. Um, but you can see floating wetlands kind of um, uh, appear retrofit and uh, living seawall, a green bulkhead. And, you know, I mentioned earlier, you can even hang fish baskets off of that. So I think that was, next slide. And I think that may have been my last slide. Yeah, with that, so this is a picture from one of our satellites, composite picture of the Earth. So I think that still leaves us about 15 minutes for some questions. If anybody has them, I'd be happy to answer them. Turn it back to you, Linda. Okay, I'm going to unmute everyone, or if you want to tell me you have a question. Um, let me just look. I had a couple questions. Um, uh, Jean, I will get you a copy of that video. But let me unmute everyone. Hmm. Is everyone's unmute now? If you know how to unmute yourself, you can, or if you want to raise your hand, I will try to unmute you. I'd like a copy of that also. Okay, now. Thank you so much, Simi. That was a great presentation. Oh, thank you. Yes. Didn't realize you did so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, you know, it's uh, somebody I, I learned. I, hopefully I wasn't too uh, technical or, you know, uh, or, uh, but hopefully people just learned a little bit more about NOAA. We, uh, we're trying to do a better job of explaining to people what we do. A lot of people have heard of us, but um, some haven't. Um, everybody kind of knows of the weather service, uh, but they don't really have a full appreciation of all the, the things that NOAA does. True. Yeah, I was surprised. Uh, can you, could you give us, uh, let us know uh, how much the ocean rise uh, in Virginia uh, is causing problems at this time without being political. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I, I, without giving you an exact number, um, because it different, differs by different areas right. um, in Virginia, but uh, I can provide, I'll give to Linda a tool like where, so you can go and look up your address or your zip code or, or an area and you can see the tidal predictions. But uh, just in general, Norfolk, the Hampton Roads area is one of the most highly um, impacted sea level rise areas in the nation, if not the world at the moment. Um, and it has some to do with land sinking together with um, 
you know, uh, sea level rise, but that, you know, just n normal monthly tides are now flooding roads. So, and again, without getting political, the, the, the Navy obviously has a major presence in the um, Norfolk area. And when they said that their number one secure or security issue uh, was sea level rise, in particular in that area, they were not joking. Um, and in some other areas as well. So, uh, but it, I, yeah, so if there's a, um, maybe Linda can get back to me uh, um, with if there's a specific locale, I can try to, um, you know, get that information to you, but I can really probably better provide the tool and then you can search around different places in Virginia or even different states or wherever. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, these, there, some of the other tools show, like, um, the, like the sea level rise and the land inundation uh, is kind of a one model. But then, like, during storms, we get things like what's called, uh, you know, the storm surges, and people have heard, and, and even wave run-up. So, like, during a storm surge, as erosion starts happening, that allows for the water to go up even further. Um, so, we have models which show like, um, and you probably, people have probably seen them on TV to show storm surge um, models from, from hurricanes. By the way, this, uh, you know, NOAA does the, uh, we have the Hurricane Center and the Weather Service, and they did the hurricane predictions and uh, should be having an interest in summer. But they, you, sometimes you'll see on the on the TV and stuff, uh, they, they show the maps of the storm surges, you know, where they estimate and how high they expect the surge to be. And, and of course, when the prediction goes wrong, that's when we really look good. But generally, uh, we're, we're, we're pretty good. Uh, the weather, I, I don't work in that area, but they're, they're pretty good. But, you know, predicting the weather and predicting climate, um, you know, it's a lot, it's, they are predictions, but they're based on a lot of science. So, me, I have a question. When sure. there's an oil spill, what is generally the mutual aid response? Do they send people from different areas to that region, or is it more remote? Um, no. Uh, well, with us, like with the deep water, you know, that was in the Gulf of Mexico. That's outside of my region, but it was it was called a spill of national significance. Yeah, it's a, particular one, but it was so big, we had to send people from everywhere. But in all the areas I mentioned in the preparedness, there are uh, spill response plans, you know, so with the Coast Guard, with the state response agencies, FEMA, uh, but also um, the, the refineries or the shipping companies, you know, are, are involved in these. So, you know, depending on how big the spill is, they, they can be responded to locally, regionally, or, or nationally. Thank you. That that, uh, that deep water spill was really interesting for me. It was kind of a double-edged sword. It was a great opportunity for me to work with species I don't usually get to work with, like uh, humpback whales and all the different sea turtles and dolphins, things like that. But this, just wish it would have been under different circumstances. But in, What is the general health now of uh, the marine species, like for instance, the dolphins? Because a few, a year or two ago, they were saying that a lot of them, there was a, a there were a lot of them dying and there was a low uh, birth rate, et cetera. Is it better now? Yes. Um, well, um, in Barataria Bay, which was the most impacted bay from the oil, not yet. Um, it, what complicates things is there was what was called an unusual mortality event, meaning that a lot of dolphins were dying before the spill. And sometimes that's from weather. Sometimes that's from, you know, harmful algal blooms or different type of, uh, um, you know, diseases, viruses and such. Um, but in Barataria Bay, there was a lot of aborted fetuses and um, things like that. Now, with the Exxon Valdez spill in Alaska, and this, is, this was a case I had to make because generally you don't see 
like you know with uh with a duck or uh with fish you'll see you can count the bodies you know after they're immediately exposed but as i showed in those pictures they can swim away you know they get exposed in different ways they're breathing so they're you know they don't really get the dermal um skin type of, of things but it may take years so like with the exxon valdez and the orca um whales it took 20 years but that pod eventually went extinct So it's you know that's uh, it'll uh, another one may move in at some time, but uh, you know in in Virginia on the area uh, um, on the coastal issues, uh, one of one of the things um, I think there has been some unusual mortality events for uh, even some whales now washing up. Uh, you know what the we're in the area of a lot of shipping, so the the northern right whale is a is a whale of concern that gets hit by ships a lot, but there's, um, you know, humpback whales, and, and as the ocean waters are rising, we're getting more and more uh, species, especially turtles. So, uh, that, yeah, in that uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, they do look at the marine mammals and such, but, you know, um, just about every, all sea turtles are pretty highly endangered. They're on a, on a, on a recovery curve, I would say, you know, they, they were really, Har their eggs were harvested and the fishing uh, was good. So they're, they're recovering. You can see some good news, but um, in the same, but every, pretty much all the, uh, all the whales are on the endangered list is, is too. And, uh, you know, so they're all kind of imperiled species, but, you know, some are recovering and some are barely hanging on. I mean, in addition to oil spills and things like that, what about toxicity added to the water, like agricultural runoff or even laundry detergent, things like that affects the water? Does that, is that something you all work with? Yeah, yeah, those are called like emerging contaminants, but especially like, uh, you know, fertilizers and stuff from agriculture, that's a main big part of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, you know, uh, management in Pennsylvania, which doesn't have any uh, you know, bay front property, but they're the largest contributors of nitrogen and nutrients and stuff. But they cause the harmful algal blooms and the uh, the dead zones. Um, so that's definitely managed there. Now there's some other contaminants. Um, um, that, as I think I mentioned, they're called emerging contaminants, but um, like a lot of fire retardant chemicals. Um, a lot of chemicals like uh, chemotherapeutic agents that are passed through human waste are not, um, ne you know, necessarily treated before they're released. So we find all kinds of stuff, uh, even, even drugs, you know, in the war, in the environment. Um, you know, the, the list of hazardous contaminants are the focus for like water treatment and for, you know, cleanup, like even for Superfund, it hasn't really been updated that much in years. And that's, that's, that's probably getting into politics a little bit, but you know, it's not, they, they don't have a regulatory status. Uh, so there's a lot of things that don't have a, a regulatory status. But there's a lot of people, you know, we monitor um, for them together with a lot of people. So we have an idea, but you can see things happening like in the Potomac River. Uh, and I think on the Shenandoah River, there was a lot of observations of like intersex fish. That's from a lot of, uh, you know, uh, pharmaceutical drugs. Not trying to scare anybody, but you know now we can measure, aware. you know, to such low concentrations and stuff that we can detect. But the thing is, we don't really know what kind of effects that they occur, you know, that occur. But you know, we do see some alarming things, um, especially with the fish. And so you know, we're still kind of in a canary in a coal mine type of phase for a lot of these things. Any other questions? 